My mum was diagnosed with late stage breast cancer in 2009. It was a struggle and the doctors didn't expect her to pull through, but she did like a champ. My mum is a fighter and as she puts it, refused to let cancer kick her ass. Fast forward to 2012 and she decided to undergo reconstructive surgery. This surgery goes well and she is put into recovery. She spends a day drifting in and out of consciousness, which was expected after a surgery like that. The whole time, she is still hooked up to a morphine drip to help her pain. After being reassured by the doctors that everything was fine, we decided to go to our homes and shower and sleep. My sister though, elected to stay just in case anything went down. Fast forward to the next morning, and my sister is calling me in tears, saying I needed to get to the hospital right now. I rush up to the hospital, and am pulled aside by the doctors, and told that my mum has suffered some complications from the surgery, and is in a coma. A half hour goes by, and my stepdad arrives, and the doctors pull him and I into a room and they say that her lungs are filling with fluid at a fast rate. They say she is unlikely to recover, and we need to make a decision to keep her on life support or to pull the plug. We refuse to let her go like that. Three days go by, and my mum starts showing some cognitive activity, and by the end of the week, she fully wakes up. The relevant part happens after she awoke. She looks at my stepdad and I, and asks when we came into the room. We tell her we've been here all week. She seemed really dumbfounded, and replied that she'd only been in the room for a day or two. She then asks where her grandmother had gone. This specifically creeped us out. My great grandmother passed away in early 2007. When my stepdad tried to explain this to her, she replied that she had spent the last couple of days with her talking about the family. She said that grandma got really weird and told her that she can't give up because she had children to take care of. According to my mum, around the time grandma said this, mum became aware of us being in the room and grandma was gone. It wasn't really weird to hear her talk about it and to this day, she has no recollection of being in a coma. She knows she was now, but all that she can remember is spending a few days in the hospital with my grandmother, just talking about the family. I had been a nurse for a number of years back home in the States. And after a few things happened in my life to give me some fresh perspective, I wanted to do something a little different. So I volunteered with a charity and became a relief nurse in a third world country. I don't want to say where exactly it was for privacy reasons, but it was very remote to say the least. And the hospital building we were in was tiny. We had just about enough to get by, but there were always so many people in need of assistance. You can't even imagine how long they had to wait. I felt so sorry for some of them, but this was a free charity run hospital and we were insanely understaffed. Anyway, the reason I wanted to share this story is because of what I experienced in that hospital. I'd start to notice that the local nurses and doctors would avoid the back part of the hospital as much as they could. Whether it be walking there, allocating patients there, they desperately try and not send anyone that way, unless they were very near death. That's something I picked on quite quickly. 
After working there for a few months, I finally asked, more out of curiosity, why exactly they did that. One of the nurses then went all hush hush on me and pulled me in to a storage closet. She turned on the light and said to me in hushed tones that they didn't like sending anyone in the back because that's where the death is. The death being a translation of what the word was. I asked her to elaborate and she said that many years ago when this hospital first opened, there was a nurse who worked here who got pregnant illegitimately with the child of a doctor. She had the baby in the hospital and the doctor refused to acknowledge it was his child. The nurse was furious, so she confessed of the secret affair to his wife. His wife, however, refused to believe her and in her desperation, one day came into work and hanged herself in the back of the hospital. That story really got to me. And for a moment I stood there dumbfounded and confused and asked her if this was true. She nodded and told me to be careful and said that the reason they didn't like sending anyone back there is because people have seen her and her spirit is vengeful. And they feel that when they put healthy people at the end of the hospital, they slowly start to deteriorate and in some cases have even died and that it's not worth the risk. Please bear in mind that I have been a complete skeptic for my entire life and had never experienced anything remotely paranormal to convince me otherwise. I nod, mostly out of respect, and say that I won't go back there anymore, unless necessary. So that was that, and life went on. I never saw any spooky happenings, but it was always in the back of my mind especially when going down there in the dark. Now, as this was relief work, I did have a fair bit more work than I usually would, but I was enjoying it. And at one point, I'd been asked to work the night shift, which being a night owl, I gladly took up. It was actually a lot better for me. Less people were coming in, the staff were just as nice, but I got on a bit more better with them than the others, which was always a bonus. That's where I met Julia. Me and Julia got talking, and one day I asked her if she'd heard the ghost story of the hospital. She told me that she had, but only after she witnessed something. I asked her if she cared to elaborate, and she told me that one day she was pushing someone in a gurney towards one of the back rooms when she saw a shadow pass by the hallway. As she entered the T-section of the hallway, she turned to the left and there was a shadow still walking away. Her eyes followed it for a moment, but it vanished. Her heart dropped to the floor and she ran all the way to the room. Apparently she stayed in there for a good 10 minutes too terrified to leave, and the patient saw it too, and was pretty freaked out as well. She tried not to talk about it, but when she returned to the nurses station, the other nurses instantly knew what had happened, as there's only one reason why you go so white in the face after coming back from the end of the hallway. Although I found her story interesting, I still wasn't moved, and assumed it must have been a shadow a reflection of the light, and that it was simply impossible. Two months down the line though, all of that changed. We had a patient who wasn't in the best of sorts. We were treating him after his leg had to be amputated. Cancer does that. And I was asked to take him to the back of the hospital. So I did. We barely had enough rooms, and we were pretty much full at that time. As I was taking him over there, I looked around and saw nothing. 
always keeping caution in mind, just in case I was wrong. I get him set up in his room, and he seems quite content. And so, I ask him if there's any more he needs of me, and he says no and turns on his TV. Small TV, might I add. As I walk out and prepare to return to the nurse's station, I feel a cold chill behind me. Bear in mind this was a very warm country, so although a cold chill was usually welcome, it was incredibly unexpected. I turn around and see nothing. And when I look back to continue walking to where I was going, that's when I see something. A shadow, clear as day, strutting along the hallway. I freeze, I blink my eyes, and the shadow still proceeds. Then I see it, walk into the room at the end. I absolutely lost my shit and ran back to the nurse's station. I remember the clacking of my shoes as I made my way over, sound heavily in the hallway, echoing, alerting the other nurses to my presence. One of the nurses who were already told I didn't believe the story gave me a little smirk and said that I'd seen her too. All I could do was nod, and after a while managed to inform them that he went into room 119. One of the nurses looked up at me, panicked, because she knew that was her patient. After about 10 minutes of calming down, the nurse went over to check. Sure enough, he had passed. He was already about to expire anyway, so it wasn't that much of a surprise, but it was slightly earlier than we had anticipated as we thought he still had a few good days in him. Nonetheless, that changed my perception about the paranormal. I only saw her one other time when I was working there, and again, it was from a bit far off, and it gave me serious spooks. I'm glad I did the relief work, but I wasn't all that comfortable in that hospital. I kept in contact with some of the nurses and found out that a few years later, the hospital was demolished and replaced by a big, new, better equipped hospital that was state of the art, which was absolutely fantastic for the area. I really hope the nurse or the spirit or whatever it was doesn't choose to come and find this new place. I had acne scarring and hated it. I read medical articles and managed to learn about something called chemical peels. I was intrigued, so I went to a plastic surgeon and asked him if he did chemical peels. He said he'd never done one, but had heard about the procedure and was willing to give it a go. I gave him a book with a bit of information and a few weeks later went to a private hospital for my peel. I should add that this type of peel is rarely conducted these days. It's a very deep peel, bearing no resemblance to the usual peels which are most often conducted now and which are no way near as deep as the ones I had. The doctor told me it would be cheaper if he didn't perform the chemical peel in theatre, and he fitted me in between doing a boob job and an ear surgery. My procedure was conducted in a storeroom, all true, and the doctor made himself comfortable on a stack of packs of toilet paper. With him, there were two nursing sisters who'd been with him earlier that day doing the boob and ear jobs. They were falling around like little kids when the teacher was out the room. I had to lie on a lowered gurney with my head literally on the doctor's lap. He placed the chemical peel liquid, which was in a very small bowl onto my chest, before he began applying the chemical solution. He said in a very matter-of-fact way, that I should be more concerned about getting a boob job 
then about a few scars on my face. Then he began applying the chemical peel solution using a cotton tip. The pain hit after about 30 seconds. Indescribable pain. But I couldn't move because there was a bowl full of the acid sitting precariously on my chest. I was silently screaming for 10 minutes before one of the nurses realized something was wrong. Actually, it was when a splash of the chemical solution burnt her hand that she worked it out and went dashing out of the storeroom to wash it off, cursing like mad. Every touch of the chemical soaked cotton tip felt like a deep knife slash, a very slow slash. The nurse returned to the storeroom and said to the doctor, she needs pain relief. That stuff hurts like no one's business. But the doctor replied in a bored voice, I'm nearly done though. No point giving her anything at this point. So the nurses each held one of my hands for consolation. They'd asked me if the stuff was hurting me, and I could only reply by making a groaning sound. One of them wrenched her hand away from me, as apparently I had been crushing it in my pain. Afterwards, I was wheeled into a room and left alone, and the pain must have kicked in because I needed to vomit. There was nothing there I could use, so I leaned over to vomit into a waste paper basket. I must have passed out. And the next I knew, a nurse was calling out in panic, and it woke me up. I was at that point still hanging head first over the side of the bed. No idea how long I'd been like that. She was staring straight at me in horror, and asked me if I'd been burnt in an accident. I couldn't speak. I felt as if my tongue was swollen. The doctor had only booked me in for one night, so next morning I was asked to leave. A nurse found a scarf from somewhere and told me I could use it to cover my face. A friend came to collect me, very tactful friend, but even though she tried not to react, her shock and disgust were palpable. When I got home, I saw that my face looked like a cow's liver that had been under a grill for far too long. It was crusty, purple, red, and already weeping out of the cracks in the toasted liver surface. I wore a scarf over my face for two weeks to walk my children to school and at any point I was outside. I was beyond mortification at that point. Naturally, everyone stared at me and talked about me. The full face thick scab drove me crazy with itching. So I used to stand under the shower, trying to pluck chunks of my scab off. My father's second wife was a nursing sister and dropped by one day. I hadn't told anyone I was having the chemical peel so she was shocked by the situation in which she found me. She phoned the surgery of the doctor who performed the chemical peel and tore strips off him for not arranging any aftercare or medication, such as antibiotics and antihistamines. I should also mention at this point that when the nurse at the hospital discovered me passed out over the waste paper basket, she asked me if my face hurt. I nodded that it did, but because my doctor hadn't prescribed any pain relief medication before going on holiday, the nurses weren't even allowed to give me aspirin. Finally, the scabs fell off, leaving my skin tight and shiny and bright, bright red. It took a few months to cool down to something approaching a normal colour. In subsequent talks with my doctor, he said that because he'd never conducted a chemical peel before, he hadn't realised it would be painful. It made me laugh to read in a leading women's magazine a few years later, that the same doctor, who was now 
the head of plastic surgery in my country, warned people about chemical peels, that they were dangerous, and because of the chemicals, including a derivative of creosote can be absorbed, they had the potential to destroy the kidneys, and in fact, had been implicated in several deaths worldwide. For this reason, he said in the article, such peels should only be conducted by experienced surgeons under full anaesthetic because of the pain factor and require intense follow-up and monitoring and treatment. There's more though, including a second chemical peel conducted by the same doctor at the same hospital, again unsuccessfully. But to continue would only testify to the desperation to rid myself of acne scarring at the cost of potential death, definite pain, and insane trust in the doctor's promise that he'd take the procedure and me more seriously next time, when clearly that doctor was a cocaine addicted sadist, who nonetheless rose to the highest position possible in my country that a plastic surgeon could ever hope to attain.